Hi all, just stopping in this week to walk you through some moves you might make in your own research essays by looking at a few model articles. In particular, we'll be discussing a few ways you might present your thesis, how you can use quotations in your paper to support a point, and what your works cited page should look like. Let's look first at some thesis statements. The first is from a student paper that explores the inconsistencies in who Duncan gives his trust to and how he expresses it. The first thing to notice before we even look at the statement is the thesis's specificity. The student does not write about Macbeth, but rather develops an argument based on a specific character in the play and his use of a specific concept, trust. Let's look at the statement, which really just serves to kick off the discussion. Quote, Macbeth's King Duncan proves enigmatic in his placement of trust, end quote. Immediately, as readers, we want to be shown what the writer means by this. We, we want this statement to be supported. We want evidence from the text, and that's what the writer eventually gives us. Now, the greater meaning of this point is still not revealed and probably not clear to us as readers. And this writer actually waits to the end of the paper to truly contextualize it, adding in the last paragraph a critique of Duncan, saying, quote, his failure to be wary of the mistreated Macbeths shows instability in his character, unquote. So it takes the entire essay for the writer to really prove their thesis, but they present this idea about Duncan and trust right in the first sentence. Let's look at another approach now from the article Macbeth Imagery of Destruction. After providing some theoretical background from Freud in the introduction, the writer very directly states the point of the paper, writing, quote, this essay will explore the relationship between fear and guilt in Macbeth's character expressed through the imagery of destruction. Notice again how specific the writer's focus is here. They are looking at a single character through a single lens, the imagery of destruction. Notice also that the writer is very clear that this is the thesis. It says, this essay will do this. Um, feel free to do so or not based on your sensibilities. Okay, one more. J. Lyndon Shanley in Macbeth, The Tragedy of Evil, lays it on as a question, simply asking, quote, is Macbeth's fall really tragic, unquote. Again, the question is specific, and it puts the audience in a place of expectation for an answer. We might start wondering to ourselves, based on our own reading of Macbeth, this guy kills a king. Why do we feel pity when he, when he dies? Why do some of us find ourselves rooting for him? A strong thesis, then, can come in many forms, but it should be specific, set up the theme of the paper, and bring up a fresh way to look at the work, or in your case, works. Now, I just wanted to quickly show you some examples of how quotations can be successfully incorporated into your own paper. Some things to keep in mind are that you should lead with your own words and ideas and let other writers you're quoting support your own thoughts. You should introduce those writers so the reader knows where the words are coming from. And you should put other writers' words in quotation marks, and you should use an MLA-formatted parenthetical citation after the quotation. Let's look at that student paper on Duncan again. The writer, while examining some lines spoken by the character Ross, says this, quote, Ross seems to be subtly portraying Macbeth as a mirror image of the Thane of Cawdor, the traitor, unquote. So here the student makes an observation that Macbeth and the executed Cotter are similar in the way they're described, and now the writer is about to support that point with the help of a literary critic. The writer starts with the phrase, quote, critic Maurice Hunt writes, unquote, and then adds a comma, and then places the quotation where the critic makes an almost identical point that, quote, Macbeth is Cotter's mime, his mirror image or alter ego, unquote. This helps readers see credibility in the student's point and perhaps draws readers to where they can explore the idea further if they so wish. Lastly, the student ends the quotation with a parenthetical citation, Hunt 5, within parentheses. This relates directly to the student's work cited page, which we'll get to later, where readers can find the information for Hunt's work listed and go directly to the page where the quotation has come from page 5. 
I know this may be a review for some of you, but it's worth checking that you're getting all of this mechanical stuff together as you develop your draft. Let's look at one other example of an effective incorporation of quotation, this time by a professional literary critic. This is from Macbeth, Imagery of Destruction. Now watch how the writer weaves quotations in their own thoughts to show the reader at every step evidence for their assertions. I'm just going to read this whole passage. It's a little bit lengthy, but I'd like you to look at it and pay careful attention to where the writer incorporates the words from the play with their own words. Um, so, okay, here goes. As Macbeth moves with both stealthy pace and ravishing strides toward the sleeping Duncan, the hallucinated form of the dagger with gouts of blood on it directs his footsteps. It is his instrument, a potent image of terror and destruction. I see thee yet in a form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going. Macbeth is one of Shakespeare's bloodiest plays, and much of the blood imagery is associated with Macbeth himself. If we stop here to note that the writer uses the italicized Macbeth to name the play, and the unitalicized Macbeth to speak of the character. That's something you may want to um, think about using yourselves. Uh, he does not, and I'll continue now, uh, he does not believe there is anyone born who can make him bleed, but he spills so much of others' blood that he feels himself wading in it as if it were a river, a sea, and eventually he identifies himself as the secretist man of blood. Ultimately, he is the cause of his country weeping and bleeding, so that each new day a gash is added to her wounds. The poetry and imagery continually stresses the unnatural and destructive tendencies in both Lady Macbeth and Macbeth's willingness to empty the life-giving and life-sustaining body fluids of milk and blood. Their punishment is sterility. Here, the writer quotes brief phrases, short lines, longer lines, all while supporting their own ideas and observations regarding the imagery of blood and daggers. Strive to emulate this style of writing, and consider ways you can make your points richer with evidence derived directly from the works that you're studying. Lastly, let's take a quick look at the student writer's works cited page. Notice the hanging indent. Notice the works listed alphabetically. And note the clear presentation of information, not only on the works the writer references, but also on, for example, the specific editions of Shakespeare used in the writing of the article. This last point is crucial. Shakespeare is a great example of someone who's been published in many forms, so it's not really good enough to simply list Macbeth as a source with no other information. You must be specific about the edition. In all cases, refer to and follow MLA guidelines. So use the sources you're looking at as models that you can emulate in your own writing. The way we get better at writing these things is by looking at how other people have done it and figuring out what works for them in terms of thesis, structure, use of evidence, and formatting. This is how we develop our own sensibilities and progress as writers.